little bit about Digital Square. We're a thriving digital health marketplace, or really a square, where supply and demand come together to accelerate health equity through the development, adoption, scale, and delivery of digital health innovations. This initiative does this by aligning investors and government bodies around shared digital health vision based on the country's needs and priorities, working with regional and country bodies to strengthen national level digital health governance and the systems that support the transformation of health in these countries. Uh, we really look at promoting the adoption and uh, reuse of tools before looking at moving into it towards development. And we're excited to have you here today as we, as we look into this session uh, which will be exploring the fundamentals of data privacy and cybersecurity. We'll also be delving into the practical challenges that technological innovations, uh, sorry, technological innovators, implementing partners, local entrepreneurs, donors, and Ministry of Health and government stakeholders involved in the digital transformation process face when implementing cybersecurity protocols and policies and how these might be addressed. A little bit about our, ourselves, I mentioned I'm Carl Faree, but joining me, we have Nino Hezia. And Nino is an entrepreneurially spirited and pioneering technologist with over 15 years in cybersecurity. He's currently the technical security architect here at Digital Square and a seasoned professional. He has an executive level experience in identifying, qualifying, and building consensus for, as well as implementing enabling technologies for enterprise systems and facilitating business processes and strategic objectives. He has broad experience in cybersecurity, IT, computer forensics, networks, programming, and telecommunications. Uh, he's skilled in architecture and infrastructure design, as well as the entire life cycle and project management, and including engaging with the client and vendor relationship management of it. Nina believes in a powerful blend of technology, technological vision and business acumen, results in consistent development of robust business strategies supported by cost-effective, high-performance IT inf infrastructures and applications. He currently holds a plethora of certifications around the ICT space and cybersecurity areas themselves. Uh, and he's, a, while being a cybersecurity consultant, trainer, and ethical hacker, as well as security assessor and penetration tester. And he's contributed to the Open Web Application Security Project and a nonprofit foundation that works to improve the security of software. With that, Nina, I, I hand over to you to begin the, the process and sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you, everybody. We look forward to having your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Carl. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nino Harris, and I'm uh, chatting with you guys all the way from UK, south of UK, very close to Heathrow, for those who would like to know where exactly I am. I'm going to switch off my webcam, but just I wanted to, you guys to see the, uh, the voice, uh, uh, the face behind the voice is this guy here, and I will uh, walk you guys through uh, some element of cybersecurity and data privacy, and more hopefully to come. Uh, and please don't be shy. If there are any questions, do ask, as it will be important to understand where things are uh, according to where you guys are standing when it comes to cybersecurity and uh, data privacy. Great. Uh, again, thank you for uh, joining this session. Uh, in today's agenda, we are going to talk about the CIA triad, the consequence of a cyber attack, what will happen, and why cybersecurity is vital for digital health. Although in some instances, you will often hear that you would say, oh, the bad guys will not attack us. We are health. We are doing good stuff. But you will see that a lot of accidents are happening. A lot of cyber attacks are happening out there. And the target is digital health because of the nature of data we deal with when it comes to health. Security and data privacy, what, is, what are the differences here? And what could be the business implications when both elements are basically covered, not covered, what do we see as a consequence? Uh, when we use an application, how safe and how secure it is, this is where we're going to have a look at the secure development and deployment of those systems that we are heavily relying on. It doesn't matter if it is open source, closed source, proprietary source, or basically free source. You have to really have some understanding of how it was developed, whether it is safe and secure, whether it will have some consequences within your network. Practical challenges that we will face when when it comes to approach to security and what could be an action plan. I will talk about malware, mal malware pre prevention, ransomwares, and also give you guys some hints here and there. How would you be better prepared when it comes to data backup? And obviously, this is a good opportunity that we could all talk as a community that we care about cybersecurity. And it will be basically 
a start of a, a broader conversation among the community that is is dealing with health uh, information and health uh, and and the rest that it is associated with because often we might think it is only a digital device that we have to concern about the ecosystem of of cyber target is so big i think there are over 400 different elements that are involved. So if we don't really pay attention to, this is where it's gonna come back and bite us. So why cybersecurity and why data, data privacy? What exactly do they offer? I mean, they are very related, but somehow different when it comes to concept, at least for, for a person like me that I have been in the world of cybersecurity, we often see how data is basically uh, categorized. If data is categorized, it has this element of whether the privacy of this data is preserved or not. And when data is categorized, you come up with a lot of plans within your cybersecurity approach to make sure that this data that has a label to it is protected from any unauthorized access, edit, delete, and even exposure of that data. Now, why cybersecurity is important when it comes to this whole concept of protecting data? Well, without it, you will not be able to have your data as private. The privacy element will no longer be there. You will see how they are interconnected. Two different concepts, but very interconnected. Without cybersecurity, privacy basically means nothing because this is where cybersecurity is trying to preserve that element of private or the privacy word here. It will protect information, individuals, buildings, and it's not just basically digital data or, or a digital mean of an attack when it comes to cybersecurity. A physical uh, compromise of a building which will relate to some further cybersecurity attack could also be part of that. And this is what cybersecurity is trying to achieve, to, to add more and more into these layers of protection that will protect every element that is involved within an ecosystem. Now, I'm sure you guys have all heard of CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, availability of what we are trying to preserve when it comes to digital information or non-digital information. I, you know, I, I think I have to emphasize highly on these two matters that doesn't matter if it is digital or non-digital, they are all part of this data ecosystem that we are trying to make sure that it is confidential only authorized individuals will have access to it. Make sure that the integrity of this data is preserved. How would you know if I send you an email that it is the genuine email that I've sent in the first place, or the tool that I have created is still the same genuine tool without any edit from the bad guys or the man in the middle, basically. And when you have a platform, how do you know if it's going to be available when there are so many requests? We talk about denial of service and distributed denial of service. All of that, and there there's also the fourth dimension to it, which is the element of non-repudiation. I've talked about an email. How would you know this email is from me? How would you know when you update uh, uh, your operating system or an application or your phone, the update is actually from the vendor itself. This is where digital certificates, this is where encryption of digital certificate will help us to make sure that the element of non-repudiation is preserved. So what exactly is this cyber attack that we have heard of it? We have Hopefully you guys have not seen it. We have seen it in so many cases and we are constantly uh, basically hearing that, you know, a new event, a new cyber attack has, has happened. Now it is taking variety of shapes because the whole ecosystem of organizations and platforms are changed. It could be through a third party. It could be directly through a client. It could be the server. It could be physical. It could be wireless. You name it. You can see how massive it could become. But the cybersecurity is often an agent, a malicious agent that is going to control your system. Now, there are some words here that talk about stealing data, accessing data, and so on and so forth. But believe it or not, even if you do not have any data within your platform, the, the whole concept here is I want to control your system. And this is where the cyber attack is going to basically shine itself. And it could be that today you will not have any data, but most likely tomorrow it is another story. Most likely tomorrow you will have the data that I'm after. And even if you don't have that data, the computational power that your system offers is more than good enough reason for me to hack your system. There are some consequences of cyber attack. I mean, beside the personal one, beside the emotional, one. I mean, you know, we all have heard of friends, families, businesses that we are working or we have worked 
previously that they were compromised. Financial losses, loss of sensitive information, disruption of services, regulatories, legals that you have to go and the lawsuit that you need to, to go and, and tackle them and fight them. Damage to reputation, like, you know, you wouldn't really trust the system. Now, if we talk about e-health system, the health that is going to store our personal and private information, how would you trust that system? A patient will look at it and says, well, I don't trust this system. If it is compromised, my data, my sensitive data that will tell everybody in this planet what illnesses do I have, what drugs I'm taking, and so on and so forth, it is published out there. Is the same approach with when a health ministry will look at a system that it is not robust, that is vulnerable, and they spend billions in, in investment, in training, in building systems for it, and it doesn't work, or it does work, but it is full of bugs and vulnerabilities. How would you come up and and justify that there is actually a good enough reason to continue when it is not. So those are some of the stuff that we have to really pay attention. Now, as I mentioned that health in general is targeted because the, the nature of information that it is there is so sensitive and it is so personal. But you can check that from this slide that I have gathered, the cost of breach in healthcare at the moment, it is the high ranking top element, $10.10 .10 million that will be a cost of a breach for a healthcare. Healthcare is very regulated. It is very heavily regulated. And this heavily regulation might cause some issues if you don't really apply the correct steps that the regulation is asking. And you will see a slide that I will go through that. Hopefully it will make sense what exactly is going on. Now, the cyber threat or the, the actual attack could come from different countries to different continents and depend really how connected we are. This is a simple example of what is going on in Africa. You might see that many countries are not well connected. Infrastructure for internet is not there. Wireless and 4G, 3G and so on and so forth. But no Nowhere is immune. Is as, as soon as you are connected, as soon as a device is connected, it opens a window of it, an attack for an automated attacker. You know, I could have my tool that will scan the whole entire network. And as soon as it discovers there is a new IP, new device connected internet protocol, by the way, for the, uh, as it stands for IP, it will immediately start scanning this device, this server, this individual to see if it is vulnerable so I could just compromise their system. Now, the number of users, whether it is in Africa or any other countries in this planet will increase the number of internet users. It is going to be inevitable that every single item in this planet with introduction of 5G, by the way, 5G is still not here. I know in some cases you go there and your uh, cell provider will tell you that it is an 5G. 5G is not here. In a couple of years, we might see the power of 5G. When that introduction comes and everything is connected, as I mentioned, not every individual, but every entity in this planet can be connected to the network. That's how powerful it will become. But are we investing in, in, in cybersecurity and privacy and protection? That, that has to have a balance there. You know, more and more increase in number of people who are using connectivity, who are connected via internet. And we have to really also invest in, in how we apply measures, policies, regulations that will make sure that those who are, in, who are connected, they are safe and secure. Their data is, is, is private. That data is not compromised. You can see that according to the uh, uh, staff from, from Interpol in last survey they have done, 90% of businesses in Africa, they don't have any investment in cyberspace, basically. They are not really bothered. And, uh, you know, in, in over 20 years of cybersecurity experience, often you go to organization and they'll say, well, why should they hack us? You know, we don't have really any value for hackers. This is a fallacy that most players will believe in. But it is wrong because, as I mentioned, even if you don't have a data that will have any value for me, monetary value, controlling your system will be a good enough reason that I will compromise your system. So what type of common attacks do we see in health sector? Because they are different, you know, public sectors, financial sectors, education, industries, and so on and so forth. In health sector, the way that we often see the, the approach from bad guys is ransomware attack is a common one. In 2000 and 
2021, uh, an incident happened in one of the uh, hospitals in Germany, and actually somebody died because the ransomware attacked the whole entire system, and most machines that were connected, their data were basically just encrypted, and they couldn't operate this patient while they transferred this patient from one hospital to the next one, and fortunately, the patient died. Phishing attack, this is where somebody will send you an email, they pretend it is from the real one, or it could be that they have hacked and compromised the real email and they will send you an email. Always remember, don't click, don't don't panic. I know often I would say that, believe it or not, even after 20 some years of experience, when I see that my machine is doing something crazy, I panic. It's just because you know the consequences here. Distribution denial of service. Believe it or not, it doesn't require a lot of machines to bring down a service. I demoed that in our last uh, uh, adventure in Kenya with one of the global goods, a very simple uh, denial of service, and I brought down their whole entire network. Although I was, I was authorized to do that, but you guys will see, if it is not correctly configured, a denial of service or a distributed denial of service when there are so many machine used will bring down a network. Malware attack, an insider threat, social engineering attack. How can I convince you to give me information is the concept here. With an insider threat, we often spend a lot of money, a lot of time and effort on the edge of our network, basically where we are touching the internet, your firewalls, your intrusion detection system, but we barely pay attention to how an insider threat could cause an issue. Could be voluntarily, could be by accident, we really don't know. Could be they are motivated to do that, but just, just some of the elements that we have to really pay attention. It, it doesn't mean that you have to have an unhealthy environment. You wouldn't trust anyone who is working for you. It just, you have to be prepared. Now, so let's let's assume that we are under a cyber attack, that machine is compromised. How would you know if you are hacked? You know, often people will ask, oh, well, I really don't know. I mean, does, does it tell you something? Is your files are encrypted? The files are all gone. You can't access anything. Yeah, you will see unexpected requests for information. Somebody calls you and say, hey, I'm going to send you an email. Send me your bank account detail or a I have tried to reset your password. When you think, no, I haven't done that. Unusual activity could be that all of a sudden there is files missing or coming. All of a sudden, somebody is accessing somewhere that they shouldn't. Computer and network could go slow, depending really how the bad guys are behaving. As I mentioned, email, text, unusual or unauthorized access to information, those are all straightforward. You know, I have to admit this is the, the easiest part of stuff because we know how a system is going to behave and we go for basically whatever is an anomaly here, whatever is going to tell you something. The worst part is the silent hackers when it comes to recognizing an indication of an attack or of a compromise. A silent hacker or group of hackers that will remain silent without doing anything. They compromise a system, a network, a machine, or an individual, but they don't jump into doing stuff. They wait, they blend in with a the network, they gather as much information as possible, and now they behave exactly same as how a normal average client or a machine or a network will do. And this is really tricky. And you will see later on that nature of data will also determine if if your system is collecting a lot of different data different files personal information discovering if the if a system is compromised it even becomes harder and difficult now best practices for protecting against cyber attack how would you how would you make sure that you are you are safer uh, one thing that I have to be honest that, you know, in, in most cases, people will, will, when they hire cybersecurity individuals, they think our job is prevent a cyber attack. We cannot do that. Nobody can do that. What we are doing is basically making it harder for bad guys to compromise a system, making it that it will take longer to compromise a system rather than anything else. So what steps could you apply? Make sure that your software is and operating systems are up to date. Use an anti malware. I know it is easy to bypass them. I know everything here is easy to bypass, but that doesn't mean you wouldn't really apply those measures. Security in depth is the keyword. Layers and layers of security will make it harder and harder for your average hacker to compromise your system. Don't use passwords. Please use passphrases. The complexity is in length, not in 
eight characters when you have an at sign or a dollar sign. Those are long gone and we already brute force and compromise them. So don't do that. Watch the click. Just because it is an email from somebody called Nino that you know Nino, you shouldn't click. You need to understand what could be the consequence of that. Multi-factor authentication training for individuals who are recently uh, hired by your organization. For those who have been in job for 20 years, I know we often say, I know this, then I've, I've done that for 20 years. New technology is there. Like re recently there was a new vulnerability that I had to go and learn to see how this is done. Incident respond plan. Always have a plan for an incident. What will happen? Do a tabletop exercise, do a, a demo exercise, do an actual parallel exercise, see what will happen. Back up your data. I will come back to that. I will show you guys one of the methods that I will personally use and also contact security assessment. Security assessment, penetration testing, ethical hacking, whatever you're going to call it, it is required, whether it is by regulation or whether you're concerned about your security. And a security assessment is only good today when it is concluded. Tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow could be there are different vulnerabilities and different issues that we face. Now, privacy and security in healthcare. As I mentioned, it is healthcare is highly regulated due to the nature of data that we have, due to the personal information that how valuable it will be when it is in hand of wrong individual. Now, the two elements here, the privacy and security, privacy will involve controlling access to those personal information, the sensitive information that we have, how it is accessed, and also the security, basically an approach to making sure that the sensitive data that we have is well protected against any unauthorized access, alteration, delete, exposure, and so on and so forth. But in short, privacy is what we protect. Security is how do we protect the privacy here? Now, regulated industries, as you guys can see, it has a lot of costs associated to it. Only if you don't apply them, if you don't follow them, let's say if you are going with Health and Interoperability Act, or if you are going with ISO standard, with GDPR, if you don't apply, if you don't correctly apply and correctly follow this, the fines and the costs will be heavy. However, if you do, at least it will give you a unified approach to cybersecurity and data protection. Although in most cases they related to data privacy rather than cybersecurity. Like in GDPR, as an example, the seven main pillar of GDPR only one relates, which is the integrity, relates to security elements. The rest is all about about how do we store data, how do we handle data, how do we distrib distribute data, and so on and so forth. Now, does your organization have an incident? And by the way, this surveys from here onward is mainly Western countries and digital health in Western countries that have been asked those questions by IBM. Is your organization have an incident response plan and whether it is tested or not? Because having a plan is good enough, but do we know how robust it is? Having a firewall is good, but do we know how good it is? Having a car and a car that has brake is good, but have you tried to see if it's going to break and how long it will take to stop the car? It's the same concept. You will see that a lot of health organizations do not have a plan. And for those who have a plan, 37% have not really tested to see if this incident response plan is going to work or not. Now, I've talked about the uh, indication of a compromise. How do we know if we are compromised? How do we know if we are hacked or not? I will tell you that it will be much easier to to discover or to recognize if your system is compromised when data is very basic or unified. When you receive a lot of data and different type of data, it becomes harder. You can see with healthcare, an average about 232 days until somebody recognizes that they are compromised. And it is, it is like that across the whole entire globe. I used to uh, train a team from Oracle you know, the Oracle giant of databases and clouds. One of them said that they were compromised for nine months and they didn't know that. And they discovered by an accident, it was totally an accident, a, a security guard was walking uh, beside one of the, the centers and they listened to some strange noise that is coming out of these machines. So they reported it and somebody investigated that they discovered that the, the system were all compromised uh, and, and the actual uh, machines were all using, they were used for mining, for bit currencies, basically. Now, a healthy strategy to 
lower the cost of bridge here, the, 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 the actual compromise here. Be prepared. Hiding yourself, your head in sand doesn't mean you are well protected. You have to really understand and prioritize what you have, what you need to protect. Go with zero trust whether it is from external that coming to the network or from internal that goes within the network or external. Have the zero trust policy that will help you a lot. Least privilege access comes to my mind. If I'm just working for IT, let's say I'm, I'm a cybersecurity architect that I'm working with call and, and, and for path, I don't have to be admin within the network. That is not my job. I'm not an IT basically. Secure automation. In, in security automation, we all have a unified approach to how basically a lot of security elements are done. Let's say you create an account. When this account is already managed, configured, you just copy the same account and you change the name to Nino Harris. Now, Nino will have the same mandatory access control or whatever rule that you are going to apply and is the same concept, basically. It will make less room for any mistakes that we might commit to or, or it could happen. Now with cloud strategy and security maturity here, it says it goes hand in hand. Yes, it does, but you also have to remember the idea of cloud when you are moving to the cloud, it's somebody else's computer. Bear in mind who is responsible for what. Always go through proper reading your contract, your documentation at the end, when you are renting an environment, when you are using, whether it is a software, whether it is an API, you are still in charge and you have to really understand the level of responsibility that you have. Identity and access, the whole authentication, the whole authorization, make sure that if somebody called Nino, you just give me access to my email, nothing else. So to set a folder and file that is related to my work. If it goes beyond that, you need to make sure that you are checking the logs constantly. Otherwise, I might do something that later on and say, oh, we didn't monitor that. Nino is basically sneaking into the network for over a year and he has uh, uh, stolen our data for almost a year. And now, well, how are we going to deal with it? Somebody will come and say, well, you didn't apply the correct policies here. Now, again, back to this topic of uh, cybersecurity and data privacy, hopefully you guys will see much better here where the difference and where the sort of interconnected two elements are. Cybersecurity will focus on protecting digital assets and infrastructure, individuals and physical. Remember, cybersecurity is not just digital. I know in most slides and more, most webinars, you might think that it is the same concept, but it is not. Data privacy, on the other hand, is concerned with safeguarding personal data or any other type of data that your organization or yourself have a value on it to make sure that it has the privacy and the confidentiality that it is related to it. Now, data privacy, if we look at it, how it measures an approach to different type of data, financial, medical, military, personal, you name it, aerospace, and it will try to keep them private, secure, against any unauthorized access or use. Data privacy, that it tries to protect those data, data could be in three different types of stages. It could be stored. Imagine a cabinet somewhere that you have your hard copies of your contract, your passwords. It could be that data is processed and is stored. It could be a hard disk. It could be a USB. It just shows that there are many different approach to how the state of a data is. Could be data is processed while you are working on a Word document, while you are working on a database, or it could be data is transmitted from one account to the next one. Somebody is using SCP for sharing files. Somebody is accessing, I don't know, certain account using uh, an HTTPS that is going to make sure that data is all encrypted. Now, cybersecurity refers to measures that will try to protect, protect, protect the three piece here, protecting the system, protecting the network, protecting digital devices, and also individuals. I think I have to add that in, 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 in this slide, that individuals are also part of that. The weakest point in this whole entire ecosystem is still human elements. We are still weak, you know, and, and we are still in control. Skynet has not taken over. I know I'm re referencing some movies here, but it just indicates if you don't protect the individuals who are in charge, your administrators, your, your developers, 
somebody could compromise them. And if they are compromised, well, your whole entire system is compromised. Now, it will prevent unauthorized access, any attack, and any damage within those three elements of protect network system and devices. Cool. I hope I'm not bored. I'm not boring you guys with some of the common topics, but believe it or not, often the low hanging fruits are the one that will lead into a system to be compromised. I would say 80% of hack is often this social engineering, low hanging fruits that we approach. The other 20, 25% is the technical bit that hopefully we will cover that in upcoming sessions. Uh, let me just have some water. Okay, so now you are using an application. You are you have downloaded uh, an operating system. You are developing a software. How do we know if it is safe and secure? What policies are you following? Is it the old approach on agile, hybrid? Is it uh, waterfall? Or is it a combination of both and all of them with nowadays? Now, the whole idea of DevSecOps and DevOps it is an unfortunate approach to development. And I will, I will emphasize size and I will explain why it is unfortunate. The reason here is that we have combined the three elements of development, security, and operation into one package, and we are asking individual and individuals to be in charge of that. The reason is because we are lacking from human resources side of it. We don't have many coders. We, mo we don't have many security individuals, developers, operators. So we will combine them into one family that they will be in charge of these three elements. One positive approach to DevOps and DevOps. DevSecOps is the approach to security. The security will be basically from get to go, from the offset, it is from the outset, it is basically less everybody concerned about that. Do not postpone that because often in, in last decade, previous decades, an application was developed and the last thing they were concerned about how secure this application is. Now, what principles could you follow? The eight main principles that we often look at it is make sure that the security development or secure development is everyone's concerns. Don't say, well, I don't really care. It is not my job. It is everybody's concern, but not everybody's responsibility. You have to have a security team that is going to be responsible for security. The rest of team, the organization need to be aware of the policies here. Keep your security knowledge up to date. Search at least 10 minutes a day. Wouldn't really cost that much. There are plenty of communities that you could go and check. Keep your secure, secure your development environment. Make sure that it is not open to any unauthorized access, because if it is, somebody will inject malicious code into the system and you, no longer you have control over your development environment. Protect your code repositories. Secure the build and deployment pipelines. Continuously test your security. Just because you have some measures, it doesn't mean that they will protect. It, it will protect if you are sure that you have done proper testing here. And also make sure that you plan for any security flows and issues that you might face. And we will all do that, by the way. The biggest applications that are out there, they are full of bugs. It's even a small a line of a code Code, if it is not done properly, we'll have some issues related to it. Now, you have the secure application, you have the secure operating system. How would you implement that? How within your ecosystem, you are going to use this environment to make sure it is not, is not penetrable, is not compromisable by an authorized individual. Again, using the secure code practices, Least privilege of access. I don't have to be an admin. You don't have to see this room. You don't have to have access to this printer. Use encryption, implement access control, keeping software devices, whether it is operating system, a phone, a smartphone, make sure they are all up to date. Continuity on that one, using secure authentication and authorization. There are many methods of authentication. Not all of them are safe. If I tell you how many are so easy to crack even the so-called secure ones such as SSH, you would be surprised. So make sure that when you are implementing those, you select the correct one. Like a VPN without an IP security means nothing. Implementing logging and monitor, capture everything. So at least you would know what is going on inside your network. Regularly check the security of your environment and also train employees, those who are recently joining or those who will come later in future. Now, how do we conduct a security assessment? Where should we start here? And what exactly is the goal here? 
A security assessment will look at the security posture of an organization, an entity, discovers if there are any assets, discovers if they are applying any threat modeling to this whole entire ecosystem. If there are any vulnerabilities associated, can we conduct a penetration testing? Can we assess the risk here? Is it gonna be millions? Is it gonna be thousands? Is it gonna be hours? Is it gonna be minutes? All will give you a better understanding where exactly you are when it comes to security of your organization. Now, what should you consider when you are conducting a security assessment? Always remember that you have to define your scope. Security assessment is expensive, especially if you are using a third party. Sometimes regulation will force you. Health, banking, government sectors will always do that. You cannot home mark Home. You cannot mark your own homework. You have to rely on a third party. Use the right tools. Some tools are really devastating. They will cause a lot of issues. And I have been in those cases that I have brought the whole entire network down because they are powerful tools. Gather as much information as possible. Identify if there are any vulnerabilities, physical, non-physical, digital, whatever it is, and make sure that you are going to have a proper report of whatever finding it was. And I know there are sometimes scope creeps when, for example, you haven't defined the scope correctly. Some uh, uh, an ethical hacker comes and says, hey, by the way, there's a machine here. Do you want us to check that? Make sure that the contract is rewritten again that includes everything. If you don't give me a proper contract, I wouldn't touch it. And also make sure that you are going to report on mitigation and whoever is in charge to apply those mitigations, they will apply them. And after a while, your pen tester will come back and check to see oh, if those mitigations were applied correctly or not. What to avoid during security assessment? Just because there is an IP, there is a machine, it doesn't mean you are authorized to scan or test it. Make sure you are authorized. Most of these applications we use will leave some artifacts and tra traces behind. Make sure you're going to wipe them out. Do not neglect any compliance and regulation. Based on those, you will do your security assessment. Make sure any sensitive information is not disclosed. Do not ignore physical and human element as I've highlighted that a lot. In most cases, as I mentioned, 75 to 80%, the attack will come either through the human factor or the physical. Now, malware prevention, we have all heard of it. We have all have this fear of what will happen, especially when it is about a ransomware when your data is encrypted. Now, a malware, again, could be a physical individual. I will come and visit your building and steal data, damage data. I'm here as a malware, a virus, a human virus that is, or an infiltrator within a network. But in general, when we talk about digital softwares or malwares in a form of digital, it could be a line of a code or it could be a software that it will do something that it wasn't meant to do, it wasn't supposed to do in the first place. Some of the prevention and action to take. Defense in depth, as I mentioned, layers and layers of security will guide you through that. Regularly do backups. Your best line of defense against any malware, damage, accident, non-accident is backup. Filtering and blocking websites that are harmful. I know there is an easy way to bypass, but that doesn't mean you're gonna ignore it. Inspecting content based on users of use of a signature. Every file, every virus in this planet will have a signature, a hash verification. There are plenty of websites like malwarebazaar.com is one of those. When you go there and when you just copy paste the hash of that file, if it is malware, if it is malicious, it will let you know. Limit running services on a device. Always remember that you don't have to be admin even within your own machine. Why Windows is often targeted, Windows operating system? Because as soon as you buy your, your Windows personal machine, you are an admin. That will never happen with Linux operating systems. Because now if you are an admin, when I send you a virus, basically I am an admin. And also remember, prepare and be ready for an incident. We all gonna panic, as I mentioned, after panic is what you're going to come up and come up with an idea. This step to take, if, to take if your organization is already infected with a model. So why should, what should I do after panic? Immediately disconnect the machine. Make sure that in some cases you have to switch off the whole entire network, but you have to have some backup ideas. You have to have plan X and plan Z. It shouldn't be just one single plan 
of, of action and the single point of failure. Resetting every credentials, uh, safely wiping and reinstalling an operating system. A simple format is not a solution. If it is a rootkit, it goes to the root of machine. In some cases, even all the way to bias. And in some cases, even is, um, uh, if it is uh, an Intel, it has a, uh, a main processor and a core backup processor, it goes to that one. So you have to use certain tools like kill disk as an example. Verify the backup that is not infected, connect devices to clean network, install, update, and rerun the antivirus. What happened? Why it didn't work in the first place? Or did by any chance some user disable this antivirus? If it is not a good one, go for the next one. Reconnect the network, monitor the traffic, and find out to see what is going on. As I promised, I will come back to this backup, the three to one backup strategy. I know it could become expensive, but the idea here is three stand for, you have three copies of your data. And these three copies are stored in two different types of media. You select them, whatever it is. Is it DVD? Is it paper? Is it uh, a tape? Is it uh, an HDD, an SSD? You select one, and the one stand here, at least one copy is physically offsite somewhere else. It could be clouds, but again, with clouds, you have to really understand that the, the whole entire responsibility of clouds is another issue that you, your organization yourself, you have to understand it. So I cannot really tell you, let's go for that because it will offer everything. I know it offers a lot of flexibility, but if you are not aware of what is going on, the lack of following and monitoring responsibility could come back and bite you. Tomorrow your data is gone. Like if I give you an example, uh, a couple of years ago in France, the biggest cloud provider, their whole entire data services, they caught fire and data were gone. So now how are you going to get your data back if you haven't done any other plan B and C and DNF and so on and so forth. So I hope that will help in an approach to a proper backup. Good, thank you so, so much for listening. I'm gonna hand it over to Carl uh, um, and, and we'll hopefully listen more and more of your questions as, as we progress. Thank you so much, Carl, it is all yours. Thank you, Nina, appreciate the time and the deep explanation through the various topics going through. There have been some comments in the chat, but I think I see one question here. And if you do have a, a question you'd like to, to ask, please do raise your hand. But I'm going to read the question from Sam. Uh, yeah, thanks for the very enlightening presentation. Uh, it is good to capture logs, but reviewing massive log uh, security logs can be overwhelming. How do you suggest organizations to go about log reviews on a timely manner while the sheer sizes can be overwhelming? Uh, a simple answer will be to use a security incident and event management tool. Sometimes they are free, sometimes they are really expensive. Like SolarWind provide ones that it is almost about 400,000 US dollars. Most of us will not have this budget, but there are free solutions out there. Elasticsearch that will help you. There are, there's another one. I'll, I'll provide you guys hopefully a link. Uh, well, not a link, but a list of different sims that you could use. It will make it much easier because well, think about the amount of logs that we collect. I mean, billions. A machine, an average, your, your personal operating system will generate about eight to 10,000 logs a day. Now, think about an organization with thousands of machines and devices. So this is where a SIM environment will help us because it will be configured in a way that when it detects a sort of anomaly within the network, it will highlight that something somewhere is happening. Now, it could be false positive, false negative. We don't really know, but a SIM environment is like an intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system. It requires to understand your network. So on a first day, when you install them, it might not be perfect. It might take a lot of time to tweak them, but when they are tweaked, they really do provide a good job. It will make your job much easier. They are connected to SMS. They send you alerts. So anything happens immediately, somebody comes and uh, the system will send you a note and say, hey, something is going on here. So you might pay attention to that. I hope, Sam, that will help. Carl, it is yours. It does. Thank you very much, Nino. Fantastic. Do we have any, any other questions uh, from the audience that you'd like to raise?
All right. I think one of the interesting aspects is that you mentioned quite early on, Nino, is the uh, strong suggestion to pivot from passwords to passphrases. I think that's something that at a bare minimum each of us can take out here, uh, as well as a range of other information to move on with. Short of any follow-up questions, I, I do see one. Why are health organizations so slow in detecting intrusions? And that's an interesting question. You know, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, Fatih, there are many reasons behind that. In most cases, they are not ready. Uh, they haven't invested properly in security. Nature of data, Fatty, is also an issue because you see a lot of variety of data. Let's say if, if we compare that with financial sector, which is the fastest in discovery of a bridge, you have basically very typical type of data comes in. It is numbers right? It makes sense. It is basically bank. Number comes from one node to the next one. With digital sector, it is to with, with e-health digital sector is totally different. Why it is different? Because you receive patient records, you upload different type of data, different namings, different characteristic of data, different diseases. You see how complex it becomes. It adds complexity. And why it when it becomes very complex, a complex system is often chaotic to deal with when it comes to recognizing if, if there are any breaches within the network. If it is one-way traffic, you would see it and immediately you will know something is going on. Uh, if you don't, because there are so many elements with it, you rely on a SIM, you rely on IDS and IPS, and even you rely on a third party to monitor your network. It becomes very expensive, unfortunately. But hopefully that answers your question. And hopefully, knowing that majority of organization, global goods, and innovators will invest more into cybersecurity because if they don't, consequences are really uh, heavy here. Thank you. And I will also find the list of uh, sims that I could share with you guys while Carl, you go through if there are any other questions. Thanks, Nino. Uh, so there's a question about the deck and I'll get to that in a minute. But a follow-on question is, what is it, what legal framework is effective in protecting data and privacy? Uh, looking at, I mean, looking at organizations, like they need to throw a fight, but maybe they could more easily win if the overall framework regulation was effective. Do you have any guidance on that for us? Well, depend on on uh, nature of business that you do. This is where regulation to regulation will offer different. Also, framework to framework will do different. Although frameworks are not mandatory, a framework will be just as a guideline in comparison to a regulation. Let's say, for example, if you are with health, HIPAA is going to be the regulation you follow. But as soon as you add credit cards, plus the HIPAA that you have, PCI DSS. But if you are going to look at frameworks such as NIST, such as CMMC, such as OWASP, BSI, OSTMMM, they will guide you through how to do a security assessment. In, in most cases, they might go and, and overdo it when you compare them to regulation. A regulation go bare minimum. However, frameworks, to be honest, if I compare NIST to HIPAA, NIST is like, a six month job, HIPAA could be two weeks job. You see how different it is. And, and this is where your business really have to understand which one they're going to follow and for what reason. In, in recent meeting that I had with one of the uh, global goods, their idea was to be uh, FIDRAMP and FISMA certified, which are the two regulations. And I immediately asked, the, asked them this question, why would you even want to do that? Because it is not related to the nature of your business you are not basically purely cloud as in service that you offer and you are not within the US government, within the US government network that you have to go and be FISMA or FedRAMP. And then they went and they researched and said, oh, actually, yeah, your comment is correct. We don't have to go and spend a lot of, because they are expensive, you know, to achieve that. For those of you guys, because I see, some, I saw some of you guys said that you guys in Europe and in, in UK, GDPR, applying this whole entire thing isn't easy, costly, and time-consuming. And now if you think about many regulations that are involved, it becomes even harder and more difficult. But understand which one is, is going to be the correct one for your organization or which framework will also offer you the necessary approach to your assessment. And if you are overwhelmed, don't worry. We all sort of are in that situation. Just apply those measures that are 
correctly embedded within your system. For example, if you don't have wireless, ignore wireless. If you don't have mobile, ignore, and so on and so forth. I hope that answers your question and I hope that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Nino. And that's a great question. Um, just looking if there's any others coming up on the last, but as we head towards our closing remarks, I did want to state that uh, this is the beginning of a range of webinars. Uh, coming up, we have targeted webinars, particularly lined up at data privacy and security for low to middle income countries and governments, innovators, decision makers, implementers. And our next session will actually focus on data privacy and security for LMIC governments, bringing to light the status of cybersecurity in these different countries. I think the role of governments in cybersecurity efforts and how to build resilient health systems for users. Uh, we'll share the registration details after the event of this. So thank you everybody for your time today. Uh, we, the presentation is recorded and will be published uh, on our wiki and also on the YouTube channels. And hopefully we see you at our next session. Uh, in terms of the deck being available, uh, as we're able to, we will publish a PDF to it alongside the wiki link uh, to go forward with things. Uh, I did see the last one about recommendations of tools to use for threat modeling. Uh, Nino, I see you're chatting through there. Uh, it's good to see those software testing help SIM tools coming through. And hopefully we'll be providing more detail to this in the sessions to come. Well, thank you everybody for your time today. Appreciate it. It looks like we're at the end of our questions. Enjoy some time back and we'll see everybody in cyberspace. Great. Thank you so much. Cheers.